Claire Yuan, and I'm pleased to welcome you guys tonight to PSU, the PSU sponsored event, Sex, Science, and Society, a conversation with Natalie Angier. Uh, the Promoter Student Union is a nonpartisan student-run organization that seeks to foster campus dialogue on timely issues. We do so by bringing speakers together in order to represent multiple angles on various current events and debates. We do not intend to promote any single perspective, but instead encourage the campus community to challenge assumptions and consider unfamiliar points of view. Natalie and Jay began writing for the New York Times in 1990, covering genetics, evolutionary biology, medicine, and other subjects. Her column focuses on the fundamentals of science, using news events to explore the basic principles that govern the natural world. Before this, she was a staff writer for Discover Magazine, the senior science writer for Time Magazine, an editor at the women's business magazine Savvy, and a regular contributor to The Atlantic, Parade, American Health, Mademoiselle, and other magazines. She has also been a professor at the New York University's Graduate Program in Science and Environmental Reporting and a professor at large at Cornell University. Ms. Anjay won a Pulitzer Prize in 1991 in the category of Beat Reporting. She has received numerous other honors, among them the AAS Westinghouse Award for Excellence in Science Journalism, the Lewis Thomas Award for Distinguished Writing in the Life Sciences, the Exploratory and Public Understanding of Science Award, the Barnard College, College Distinguished Alumna Award, and membership in the American Philosophical Society. Her books include Natural Obsessions, The Beauty of the Beastly, Woman, An Intimate Geography, and The Canon, A Whirly Geek Tour of the Beautiful Basics of Science. Hosting our conversation with Ms. Angier is Pomona's own Dr. Ra Dr. Rachel Levin, Associate Professor of Biology and Neuroscience. Professor Levin teaches courses here on animal behavior, neuroethology, and ecological and evolutionary biology. She received her BS from Antioch College and her PhD in Neurobiology and Behavior from Cornell University. Her research focuses animal reproductive behavior, both on the function of behaviors, such as animal language and mating strategies, as well as the hormonal mechanisms that underlie them. She and her students are also working on a study on a, on a study of biological influences on the development of transgender identity in humans that now has over 1,000 participants. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ms. Anjay and Professor Levin. Some people express relief, feeling that their identity was finally legitimized. Others from churches said that if one had the gene, it was just God's way of challenging you or testing you to see if you were capable of doing the right thing under pressure. Some said, well, this gay gene is weird and maladaptive, and there aren't really any other gay animals, so the gene must be a weird mutation. And finally, there were speculations about whether Hamer himself was gay and that this colored his science. 
So amidst all these different points of view, what seemed to get lost, one of the things that got lost was the quality of the science. And two years after he published his paper, Hamer was called before the National Institute of Health to testify as to whether he had falsified his data or excluded data from study that were inconsistent with his hypothesis. A study four years after that used the same data, different statistical approaches, and found no significant result. So somehow the retraction of this story never made the big time the cover of science or even a good headline in the New York Times. And the idea of the gay gene has somewhat faded from public consciousness. What happened to Hamer? He wrote three books, which are widely acclaimed and well-liked by viewers on Amazon. One was called The Science of Desire, one was Living with Our Genes, and the last was The God Gene, all of which got three and four stars by Amazon reviewers like yourselves. So what can we take from this story? We can take that we tend to relinquish power to science when we ask for diagnoses or we ask to be legitimized. We can understand that we fear and complain about the power that science has when its results frighten us or upset us. And we then question what motivates these scientists and the science that they do. We feel duped and betrayed when subsequent research shows a scientific result to be wrong. So my point in starting us with this story is that it's a fascinating complex relationship that we have with science, all of which through which we can weave an idea about scientific literacy. Now Natalie Andrew has been a science reporter and close observer of our relationship to science uh, for over 20 years. So tonight we'll hear about her views on a number of timely topics and their history and her perspective over a couple of decades of watching. The PSU has asked that we converse for 45 minutes, and then we open for Q&A for the second 45 minutes. But if you really can't restrain yourself and must ask a question, I'm sure we're open to answering it before that. So I thought it would be nice to start, Natalie, with talking about how you became a science writer in the first place. Uh, OK, but before we get to that, I have to say that I was actually very skeptical of that report. Um, it wasn't conveyed by the headline, but my story was certainly not gullible. Um, so I, I guess I don't think the reporting on it was uniformly bad. It just, it was an exciting topic. One of the things that you have to realize is that we can't sort of decide what's appropriate to report on. We can only do the best job possible, but we can't sort of say, well, I'm not going to report on this because it may be offensive or even that somewhere down the line it's going to be overturned um, you know you just can do the best that you do when you report it and I, I have to say I, I tried to be pretty pretty measured and skeptical about it um, how did I get into science writing well I actually think that it's it's a great opportunity to bridge the, the, the two cultures, as C.P. Snow called them, the, the humanities and sciences, and, and I was always interested in both of them, and so I was kind of trying to find a way to bring them both together. But when I was uh, back in college, there was very little science writing at that point, so I thought about start, starting my own popular science magazine for the general public. I just had this kind of dream that this would be a great way to spend a life. But then when I got out of college, I realized that starting a magazine was probably beyond the means of somebody. At that point, I was just like 20. And so um, I started doing technical writing and then heard about Time Magazine starting up exactly the magazine I had fantasized about, which was going to be a popular magazine about science for the general public. And I applied for a job and I got it. So I kind of was in on the ground floor at the beginning of what became Discover Magazine. Um, and it was, a, it was a wonderful experience to see this all start up and to see this blossoming, this new field of science journalism, science writing, which took off after that. Everybody thought this was the way of the future, and it was for a while. And then it kind of hit a wall, realizing that um, 
that we weren't able to sell ads to people who wanted to buy Mercedes-Benzes and so on, that it wasn't actually appealing to that same um, dynamic, that same stratum of the public that we had been hoping to reach. Instead, it was really more of the popular science uh, kind of tinkering crowd. And they're not the ones with as much of the disposable income. So you hit reality of um, the desire to transform society hit the reality of the fact that the money wasn't there and so things contracted after that. So it's been this crazy ride of just seeing this take off and then contract back again. We are now in a period of contraction that has been fairly depressing for those of us in the business, but at the same time, there are certain developments coming up that I think people can participate in more, and that is the whole phenomenon of online science writing. And we can talk a little bit about that, more about that as we go on. But um, it's a great opportunity to bring the two ways of looking at the world together, the sort of the rigor of the sciences together with the imaginative freedom of the humanities. And writing about science has been a glorious opportunity to do that. So I'm sure I know for a fact that there are students in the audience who would love to be science writers. What advice would you give to them in preparing themselves to pursue such a career? The number one piece of advice I have um, for anybody who wants to write about science is to get a doctorate in science first. And even if you're not going to be a practicing scientist, I can tell you that nowadays most of the people who are coming into science writing do have a doctorate, um, and that it will give you the kind of flexibility throughout your career that a degree in journalism just won't. So you can then go on and take this doctorate, and you can write books, and you will be much more credible as a source than you, are, you will be without it. You can go into ancillary ways of doing science writing through science policy and um, <clears throat> other kinds of fields that involve really being very fluid with your writing skills. And it will serve you well th for your entire life. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to just consider that the world is really, it's like it's your candy store. And that you have to maintain the sense of of curiosity and of <coughs> wanting to understand everything. And one of the things that really inspires me about science writing, I get very depressed about the world in general. I and mean, if you live in Washington, as I do, and you see politics, and you can really think that we just, humanity is really screwed up. And then you read about a new scientific discovery or some, just even a small finding. And I can tell you, this is like, this, you, read these things like so wonderful. You can almost start crying. It's fascinating things that continue to be discovered. Um, and science is good news with a forebrain. And so it just really keeps you going. It gives you faith in the future of humanity. Um, and if you have that spirit, then go for it. And if you don't, forget it. I mean, if, you, if you're kind of just looking on it as, as uh, almost a kind of a technocratic perspective. You have to come in there with that, just that feeling like this is the greatest job on earth. And if you have that feeling, even in these bad economic times, you're going to find a place. I can guarantee you. The world needs more science writers with passion. You started to answer one of the questions I wanted to ask at some point, which is where do your ideas come from? I think the important thing to realize is that every question that you have in your mind is going to be a question that other people will have. And so you might want to consider using your own experiences to give you that unique perspective. Um, there's one thing to follow the news, and it's another thing to actually come up with ideas. And people really like that. Uh, for example, um, I, I you know, did, did something recently on the color blue. And so what is our response to the color blue? And why, do, why does it make us feel this way? What are all the cultural interpretations of it? The sort of physiology of blue. I was reading something about the history of blue pigment. And just 
these kinds of awarenesses about the world around you are going to make the best stories. They're going to make the stories that people are really going to want to read. Or just another example that I had, this was something I did. I was putting on a pair of shoes, and I realized that women's shoes just feel, you know, they, they hurt your feet. And so, and it's not just the high heels, like the whole thing. I got to write about why women's shoes don't fit women's feet. And, um, and it turned out to have some surprising answers. It wasn't just, so oh, well, you know, a pointy toe and a high heel. There are other differences between the way they make men's and women's shoes that explain a lot about the difficulties that women have. But this is just sort of saying, I'm surely not the only person who's curious about this. It was an enormously popular story. But just to have faith that the observations you make about the world are probably going to excite other people too. sort of two, two reasons to talk about yourself. Well, three reasons, really. If you, if you want to kind of, if you put yourself in the story and, and if you're writing about a field experience, then that, I think, is a legitimate thing to talk about from a personal point of view. Or you can just put yourself in it because um, it, it just makes for a more uh, engaging narrative sometimes. You have to do it judiciously, not too often. But the, the real reason I did it in the case of um, in the case of the atheism story, was I felt like things were getting out of control with religion was starting to have too much of, a, of an impact on all of our discussions, including you know, people just people like sensible politicians starting to say unsensible things because there was such pressure on them to, to state their religiosity. And I thought, this is out of control, and it's going to hurt us. So I was going to just say, hey, look, I'm an atheist. I, and I, you know, I know it's a, lonely, it's a lonely place to be, but I actually object to being force-fed sort of political public religion. And I actually have to say that I had an enormously positive response to that article. People just felt so relieved to have someone talking about it. They were feeling that same sense of this suffocating conformity that was being demanded of people, um, and just to have it come out. And since then, there have been, of course, there's this whole, what's called the New Atheist Movement, uh, people like Richard Dawkins and uh, <clears throat> Sam Harris, and much more public speaking about it. But at that point, it was pretty rare. But it was a very positive uh, outpouring. Um, I've written other things about atheism that have been a little bit more contentious. For example, when I was questioning why scientists would always say to me, you have to tell the public that evolution is real, because there are too many creationists who are claiming that they're starting to influence things too severely, so tell people that evolution is real. And I wrote an article saying, well, scientists, why stop there? Why not sort of question a lot of the other uncredible parts of religious dogma. Why not talk about the really tiny likelihood of resurrection or virgin birth or you know any of the other things um, and talk about from a scientific perspective. Forget about just what what is the probability of this happening? So um, that one got more angry response. <laughs> Well, not so much scientists as people who you know other sort of philosophers or, or more high-minded uh, kind of theologians. And I think one of the things that they always say is that I have a very narrow view of religion and that I'm being very simple-minded in how I'm analyzing religion. But one of the objections I have to that is that you never really spell out what 
what exactly it is that you believe that is beyond this narrow definition of religion. But anything that involves a supernatural component, uh, any, any perspective on religion that has anything supernatural about it, I think is open to serious questioning. Just asking for, you have to specify what you're talking about, what the evidence is, and so on. And all of that is fair game. Scientists have an obligation in this regard? Mm, probably not, because they're already <laughs> hurting for money. I really don't want to completely <laughs> throw them under the bus. I think, I mean, people are entitled to their faith, and, and, I, and I know some very religious scientists, certainly, but um, I think that we have. We have an obligation to speak out when it starts to affect things beyond that particular, that domain of, of their, whatever it is they believe in, when it starts to spill out and influence science more generally. One of the questions is, should we try to find common ground between religion and science? Um, and that's, of course, an ongoing question, and there's the Templeton Foundation is sort of devoted to that. I am actually more of the Steven Weinberg opinion that science works best when religion has nothing to do with it. It just, just has nothing to do with religion. That religion kind of presupposes an answer that you're looking for. And you just don't want to have that happen in science. So let's talk longer about the I think of kind of a dangerous point in history. Well, during the last election, when um, there was a, the second time that a, a huge number of Nobel laureate scientists signed a petition basically endorsing Obama for re-election. Um, now, I thought that was a good thing in, in, in terms of my husband actually works in the White House, and so, you know, okay, I want him to keep his job too. But, but one thing that worried me about that was, what happens if Romney won? What does that mean about the relationship between science and a major political party? Only recently have we had this kind of split between um, science, scientists and the, the Republican Party has actually been pretty good until recently supporting science, and by supporting I mean financial support as well as just thinking it was good for the country and for our economy. And only recently has there been this kind of growing hostility. And I do think that a lot of that has to do with the influence of the religious right on the Republican Party. Um, and that that's been very dangerous. I see that as really, that threatens our, uh, our entire enterprise because they do hold the first strings. I mean, that's the Republicans in the House. And so how are they going to be doling out money? They're now trying to get rid of, there's a very active campaign right now, and they may succeed in cutting off all NSF funding for social science um, and anything having to do with psychology, social science, political science, all that, no more federal funding of that. Uh, because they see it as a political move, that this is a way of, sort of cementing the Democratic Party in power. It shouldn't be seen that way. And once you cut out the social sciences, you can start to see other things kind of being dragged along with it. Where is that going to take neuroscience, which is, you know, kind of sometimes straddles the, the social and life sciences. And so we don't want to have that happen, but that's, that's the direction we're going in now. And it's very it's kind of disturbing to me. So how are we going to, what are we going to do to turn that around? And this is where I've also been on my kind of campaign to get more scientists involved in science policy, more scientists going to Washington and actually talking to Congress and you know, doing 
congressional testimony, lobbying. There have to be more people who are in the sciences who are out there trying to influence how, how dollars are going to be doled out. And also, more scientists involved in politics itself, more scientists running for election at all levels of government. That's going to be one way to, uh, I think, slow down this trend. You wrote a number of years after your article on atheism in Canon, uh, a whirly tour of the beautiful basics of science, which is one of my favorite titles, which was described as a thoroughly entertaining guide to scientific literacy. And I think literacy has to play into this. So what prompted you to write that? relative to these issues, and who is your intended audience? Well, I, I did, I've always been interested in basic, basic scientific literacy and also basic science. One of the things about when you're you know, a reporter and you have to worry about the news is you kind of don't get to write as much about the, the background of all the science that's already there. And so, to me, that's actually very often the most interesting part is what what this is sort of this news story is built on. So I wanted to just provide the basics for that. I do think that scientific literacy is important, um, and for the reasons that we've been talking about. That the more people care about science, the more they're going to be upset if they hear that there's been this cut in funding for basic research, the cut in funding for certain kinds of research, that that will definitely have an impact. The better choices they'll make in voting. Um, so in talking about you know, ways to get people more scientifically engaged, it's, uh, there's, there's some interesting options that come up. I also want to point out that people like scientists. Did you know that scientists are the second most respected profession in the United States after firefighters? <laughs> I was surprised too, but um, people like scientists. Uh, they, they like science. They just, they're intimidated by it, but they really like it. And I can also say that most email stories are very often science stories. People are interested in science. People want to hear more about it. More scientists should go out and talk to the public. People love it when scientists give talks. Um, scientists should go out to schools, and by schools I mean like middle schools, high schools, and talk. I think there has to be much more engagement of sci scientists in the general community. Most people never get a chance to meet a scientist. They meet doctors, lawyers, you know, business, but they don't meet scientists. If they meet scientists, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, so this is real. Um, so that I think is important. Um, science writers can only sort of handle a, a small part of this larger issue of scientific literacy, but I do think that there are are ways to engage the public um, that are increasingly uh, coming to the forefront. Citizen science. I actually really like this trend of citizen science where people are doing things like bird counts or uh, bloom count, you know, bloom timing, and um, going along and, and tagging all sorts of animals out in the wild. And, there's this other example that's recently come up called TED, this Twitter earthquake dispatch, which is really, I just learned about this, where uh, they detect these sizable earthquakes before the, the seismographic equipment can, just by people in different locations. They're sending tweets on, uh, you know, they have this, you know, using the GPS data and local data, and, and so these tweets are telling scientists about where these earth, you know, the path of the earthquake and so on. This is citizen science. This is people being engaged in science. And one thing you find is that when people get involved in these kinds of projects, they are no longer afraid of science. And it kind of spills over into their more general life of following science and being interested. That's actually been shown. The people who are involved in things like the, the, the winter bird count are much more engaged in, in scientific enterprise generally, just because they feel like they're part of it. I think 
that there's still a sort of mystique about science. I, what you were saying made me remember being in graduate school, and I knew absolutely nothing about birds at the time. And it had been suggested that I divorce myself from my previous work in primates and, do, and address the issues I wanted to address using birds for my dissertation. So I dutifully went out and found a local bird in Ithaca, New York, that I could study to see if I could even handle working with little feathered, dumb, non mammalian creatures. And there were, as it turned out, the perfect bird I wanted to study, there were six males in Ithaca, New York. So I went and visited the houses where these birds lived. And each of the women who lived, they, they tended to seek out these birds would nest in the houses of single old women. <laughs> and they would invite me in and they would tell me dogs of science about their Carolina rat. Mm -hmm. And when they'd say, oh, wait, but, but you're the scientist. And I'd think, oh my gosh, you know, you just told me everything there is to know, and yet I'm the specialist and they're not the scientists. I think we have a, a dying question. <laughs> yes. One of the problems has been that uh, the economy just kind of blew all that away. And, um, you know, it's interesting because when Al Gore's movie first came out, there was this huge popular response, and people claimed much more concern and conviction about climate change. And then when that faded from the public eye, so too did any expression of concern about it. So. We do need to sort of keep these things front and center. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's, that's interesting is for people to continue to be skeptical about it when not only their old data show, but our modeling has gotten really good in a lot of ways that people may not realize that this, for example, um, not this meteorite, but the, the asteroid, that we were able to track it very, very precisely, and we could actually and we were able to track Hurricane Sandy very, very, really with amazing precision. I mean, how, what happened as a result of it is not always known. You don't know that the New York subways are going to flood or whatever the particulars are going to be. But we were able to track that. We could track it. We can track things. We know. So don't be so skeptical, right? I mean, we are actually probably a lot of these climate models are they are really good. I mean, this is what's going to happen. This is what is happening. So the skepticism is, is really you know, misplaced. And I do think it's more of, more of the obligation falls on scientists than on journalists to keep pointing this out. Because no matter what you say about you know, science journalists, there's a limit to how much of advocacy journalism they can practice, even when the answer is as clear as evolution, even when it's as clear as climate change. You can talk about it as though you accept it as reality, but you can't keep really kind of, I mean, in, in sort of standard mainstream journalism, there is definitely a limit to how much you can sound like you're waving a flag for anything. So I think it is more up to the scientists to really just keep speaking out about it rather than to complain that that the journalists aren't doing enough, just because there, there really are much more severe limitations on how much of an advocacy role um, journalists can or should be playing on any subject. But where do you think the resistance comes from? I think that it comes from the Republican Party at this point. I really do. I think that the resistance comes from the fact that there's, there's a lot of you know, oil and gas money involved, and there's an interest in not having people be concerned about it. And they really think it's 
it's more of that than anything else. So they're just going to continue to hammer away at it it's because it's just billions of dollars involved. It's unfortunate, but true. Well, let's shift gears before we run into the Q&A, because I know that one of your most well-read well books on campus is Woman and Ancient Geography. And this book has been seen by many as an antidote to an inherently male binary view um, about the science of women, sex, and sex differences. So again, I want to ask you, given the climate, what prompted you to write that? Well, <clears throat> started off being actually, I wanted to write a book just about human anatomy generally because I felt like there wasn't a good general interest book about it. And it was my editor who said, why don't you write about women's bodies instead of just bodies, bodies. And I said, okay, that sounds like a great idea. And then when I got into it, um, I decided to kind of expand it beyond just anatomy to talking about taking it from a very small, um, so from a kind of chromosomal level up to behavioral and that's when I ran into the whole well the whole evolutionary psychology movement which has had such an impact um, and I thought that they had a very speaking of a narrow view I thought that they had a very narrow view of male and female behavior that was becoming kind of almost uh, calcified by the acceptance of, of some of their claims so I felt like somebody had to come up and present a more just a more open-minded perspective on it. So that's why I focused on that. And I really think it's important to think, Dar like, to apply Darwinian logic to understanding our, our bodies and our behavior. But I also think it's important to really be very, very, very sophisticated in how we do that. For example, a lot of the evolutionary psychologists say, well, that has nothing to do with science. Your, your perspective is political, not scientific. And then you have to say, well, if you are trying to explain human behavior, and if your model doesn't incorporate this perspective that I have, then it's, a, it, it's an incomplete model. Why say that it's, it's a model of human behavior, but it doesn't include the behavior that I'm now trying to understand, which is female behavior that doesn't fit into this, the kind of the, the ardent male, passive female model of a lot of the evolution of psychology's assumptions. And there's been a huge amount of, oh, it's been a terrible fight. Um, that anytime you raise an objection, you say, oh, so you don't believe in evolution. Well, it's like, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you are trying to box people into ways that don't accommodate all of human nature. So this is a very incomplete system you've got here. And this is the point that I was trying to make. I mean, there's a lot more to it than just this kind of taking this hog in this stuff that they were doing. So it's an ongoing debate, though, and I see it online. You know, there are listers, there are debates. Anytime someone comes up with some criticism of their work, it's like that person doesn't believe in evolution. It just seems like a very unscientific response sometimes. So it's definitely a field that is itself evolving. <laughs> <laughs> Things go slightly amok, and you're, you know, exposed to androgens, you get a 
Latinas and all this other stuff. And how would that shift what we actually looked at and studied? So um, it's, there are a number of sort of overlapping issues here in evolutionary psychology and the kinds of questions we ask. Um, and I would be somewhat generous in terms of talking about the art of male and the passive female. Some of what evolutionary psychology talks about females doing is being choosy whereas males are fighting with each other or starting their stuff to attract the attention of females. Well, what if you go out in the real world and are watching animals or, um, or humans as an example of an animal? You can see that male behavior, but how do you measure or assess a female being coy or being choosy? It's much harder to study, so I can see why one draws the attention, whereas the other does not. Yes, it's true, although <clears throat> there have been some actually interesting recent studies in looking at the difference between, for example, speed dating, this has been awesome. The idea was that uh, women were sitting there at the table and men sort of going around, and, and the men would approach, and, and they always were much more uh, interested in the female than the female would be finicky, she's choosy. What they found was that when they had the men sit and the women go around and approach, that all of a sudden that changed so that the men became much choosier and the women became more ardent. So that it was just a question more of the whether you're waiting or whether you're approaching, how interested you are. If you're approaching a person, you're more you're gonna be more likely to feel the sense of attraction towards them and if you're being approached you're going to put up your hands a little bit. And they found that that was, in, in fact, the response they got. So, and then a lot of other studies that have been done and looking at the different kinds of jealousy that supposedly men are much more likely to feel sexual jealousy and the women feel emotional jealousy. Um, but then there have been subsequent studies that have shown that, in fact, in general, both sexes are likely to feel sexual jealousy. You know, if you hear that your, your mate has been sleeping around, you're angry. And if you, you know, if they're sort of feeling, if they're expressing being, you know, oh, I really like this opposite sex friend of mine, you may be a little worried, but it's not until they sleep with them that you suddenly feel, uh, you start to feel really threatened. And they actually have shown that. And the, so, I don't know, some of these ideas of evolutionary psychology have just, when further studies are, are done under different conditions, they start to find that they don't hold up, it's not universal. But this is another example. When these new studies come out, on the other side, you have them starting to scream, you know, oh, you don't believe in evolution. I can you every time it's the, the stop response. Um, but I don't necessarily think that the field of evolutionary psychology is universally bad, by no means. There have been, there's been some good work to come out of it, and I just think that they have to really be careful and keep an open mind. Another example, of, okay, so some of the people that you mentioned about the, the, the you know, <clears throat> some of the early work that you were talking about at the beginning, um, transgender and yeah so so the idea is that there's no such thing as a male bisexual this is like part of the this is part of the creed of what they insist on and no such thing as a male bisexual because when you do these studies where you're measuring sort of tumescence of the penis in response to different kinds of um, images you get either they're responding to male or female. And so they may call themselves heterosexual, but if you see through these two message studies that they're actually responding to pictures of naked males, they're not, they're not real heterosexual, they just haven't come out of the closet. And this is basically gospel. There's no such thing as a male bisexual because of fantasy. But what is reality? Reality is that there are plenty of male bisexuals. There are plenty of men, including Dean Hamer himself, who had children, who have actually slept with women who have reproduced 
and you know whether they come out when they're younger or older, but they've had sex with women. So they've behaviorally been bisexual. Now, what does natural selection act on? It's not act on your fantasy. It acts on your actions. So to say that there's no such thing as a male bisexual, but it's still happening. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me, and yet it becomes very rigidly defended for reasons I'm not at all clear about why some of these things become gospel and are going to be defended even though the evidence suggests that there's a lot more going on here. So that's where it has to continue to evolve, this field. When we're talking about sex, sex differences, sexuality, one of the things I sort of feel compelled to bring up is Larry Summers. Oh, uh, yes. How can we not talk about Larry Summers? <laughs> um, so, for those of you who were in a coma, in, <laughs> um, in January of 2005, and in fact a conference on diversifying science and engineering workforce, um, then Harvard President Larry Summers made some intentionally provocative comments that were interpreted to mean that he thought that there were innate differences in the ability of men and women that explained the limited number of women in high-level jobs in math and science. And this is not, I mean, this comes back to the issue of science reporting, what was said, who said what, and a story taking off of itself. So since we're talking about this general issue of sex differences and whatnot, could you comment on your take on what happened with Larry Summers, how the story went out, how it evolved, and what happened to him as a result of that. Larry Summers spent too much time talking to his, one of his sort of favorite boys there, Stephen Pinker. And Stephen Pinker has convinced him that there is this innate difference that that you know, oh well, you find men males clustered more the sort of the genius and the, the idiot end of the bell curve of intelligence and, and also that men are more driven and you know, so they're sort of more competitive and there are all these reasons why we would expect to see more men in high level positions in science. Well, Elizabeth Spelke, who I admire enormously, and she and Stephen Pinker had this videotape wonderful debate over the subject she looked at all of the data. She really did a very thorough study. She also looked at all of her own data, and she studies um, how children learn math, among other things. And she said there are no innate differences. There just are none that she could find, and that you know she just blames it on. She said she blames it on sexism that keeps women from going further, and the data just are not are not at all clear about this. You have differences between countries. You have countries like Finland, where actually males and females perform at the same level, in fact, females slightly higher. You have differences between the top performers in Asian countries and you know, European and the United States. There's just, the data are all over the map, but there's no way that the president of Harvard should get up there and say, oh, by the way, I'm pretty convinced that it's genetic, which is what he did. He really did. Um, even though he tried to say that that's not what he was saying. But when you look at the transcript, he was very clearly stating allegiance to that perspective, that the real important reason for the disparity in high-level women in science, the real important reasons were differences in, in native mathematical ability, in competitive levels, and in you know, just willingness to work the kind of hours and give everything else up for the sake of science. And so I thought that that was actually, I thought he, he should not have become Obama's, uh, you know, when he, Obama chose him for his cabinet for a while. It's like, why? This guy really, I think he made a really major blunder with that. Um, Harvard business and 
and I think it sets people back. I think it's discouraging for young women in science, I think, to constantly talk about these innate differences when the data are not there to support the case. Why do that? Well, what's going to be gained by that? What's going to be gained by that is that we will have to perform according to expectations. Yeah. So I, I actually think he, he made a big booby there, I have to say. That was a big mistake he made when he came out of that conference and said that. So if he paid for it, you know, he should have. It, it was not for the president of Harvard to talk that way was, I think, pretty serious. So now I sound like advocacy journalism. I know, I know. But I actually, I <laughs> amazing things that actually I do talk to brilliant scientists and I, I love it it's just amazing um, but also my encounters with animals those have been very exciting I can tell you that uh, being able to for example go up to the treetops one of the things in Panama right but up in the trees which is where a lot of animals live and they when you talk about arboreal it means not only that they live in the trees but they never come down to the ground and this is something that i hadn't really appreciated but there are animals that spend their entire lives up in the trees and you never get to see them especially if they're nocturnal so one of the most exciting trips that i ever had was um working with this photographer who had these scaffolds constructed that brought you up to the top, to the top of the canopy, and um, we were able to spend the entire you know, nights out there with the animals as they came up there during the flowering of the. Um, <clears throat> these are these balsa wood trees, where these flowers that look like these just these giant goblets, and every evening at about three, four o'clock, the tree fills it up with this nectar. I mean, really, it's like it's this. Thing just fills up like as though there's some bartender there spritzing it. and it fills up and so all of these different animals come through and take their rounds at these these nectar filled goblets and we were up there in the trees with them just watching as this whole series of the whole forest came up there and, and just being there and watching what happening and the most amusing one though were these the white-faced capuchin monkeys which were really pissed off to see us up there. I mean, these are monkeys who are used to seeing the researchers, aha, uh -huh, down there on the ground where they can throw things at you, right? And they come up here to the top of the trees, and we're already there. And they, you could just see the, the irritation on their faces. Uh, so that was great. That was a wonderful moment. <laughs> these are the organ grinder monkeys. They're very smart. Um, and the other one was you know, shaking hands with an octopus. Now that is another experience. Because <laughs> it wraps a suck, it's a tentacle around you and then feels you up and down with its sucker so you can just feel that moving along there. And it was just like, whoa, we never felt anything like that. So these are the kinds of little privileges of, of reporting about science that wouldn't trade for anything. <laughs> Yes, there have been. Now you're going to want an example of that. So, but there have definitely been times when I've wanted to say something and I just couldn't. Um, hmm. 
I mean, I know that that comes up a lot with uh, definitely. With, I have to admit, with religion, and when when this when it comes up, and I want to just say something, and I just I I, I desist. Um, so, and also, if you feel like politically that one side or the other is actually to blame, you can't necessarily come out and state that. So, if you feel that the Republican Party is actually holding back progress on a particular, and I do think that at this point they're likely to be the party holding back. But this is not always the case, and certainly the left has had their own issues with science that I get. The whole anti-vaccine crowd, let me tell you, that is a real problem. Um, the anti-genetically modified foods, uh, there are some other issues that I think unscientific thinking is, doesn't really, is not necessarily a partisan issue. So there have been cases like that. But, um, yeah, I, so things, things where you, you, you do want to cast blame. You have to resist doing that. Yeah. You, uh, you touched briefly several times on the role of scientists. Uh, most recently in the discussion, you just mentioned that, um, quote unquote, the male scientists have the drive to be in the lab all the constantly sacrifice their life for science. Um, and the rest of that, not questioning. Uh, that is not true. Uh, but uh, I, the, I'm, uh, I'm not saying that that's something I believe. I'm saying yeah. that was an argument being made. Before. But yeah, I, but I do feel that it is a overall uh, generally accepted that scientists have to generally dedicate themselves to their work. There's a very strong that scientists do have to commit strongly to science. Um, and I guess how does that fit in with your? Also, the requirement that scientists be more outreaching and fit into the wider political sphere, because I feel like there's a really there's a strong distance between scientists. There's a, there's a wide gap between scientists that do science and scientists that don't do science. You know, or formally, you know, have PhDs but are no longer in research. Um, and so, I personally feel this has to be a shift. What do you think that shift has to be, and how do you think we should? The shift being that scientists should have more time to do outreach and not have to only be in the lab all the time. Well, I, I think that that's, that's true, and more of these grants now are, are making that a requirement of getting the money, that you have to spend a certain amount of time on public outreach. And one of the difficulties is that Carl Sagan used to complain about this. He was never, for example, he never was. Uh, elected to the National Academy of Sciences because he spent a lot of time, obviously, on trying to inspire people about science, and he paid the price in his reputation among other scientists. And this continues to be an issue that scientists who spend too much of their time doing this kind of outreach are looked on as not as serious about their science. Um, but, but that's starting to change. And why is it starting to change? Because scientists are going to have to start doing more outs more outreach for the sake of getting money. And so you have this movement, this um, you know, crowdfunding of science, which is really picking up steam in a hurry, because a lot of young scientists are finding that there's no other way to get money. The first, you know, first time grant for, from the NIH is now the age of first grant is 42 which is just ludicrous for a scientific career. So more and more scientists are finding they're going to have to go and do crowd, you know, just basically asking for money more generally, which usually means some form of real serious outreach, putting together a, a pretty you know, good video, explaining your work to the general public. So I think that the, the, the economic demand is going to lead to it being much more acceptable for scientists to to spend a lot of time talking to the public because that's the only way they're going to get money. It's just going to be the economic model, which is, you know, I mean, on the one hand, it's bad that people have to scrounge around. On the other hand, if it means that there's going to be more of a connection between scientists and the public, that has its silver lining.
environmental research field and um, when you come across a lot of courses and these good battles and studies, particularly in the field of toxicology or climate change is the famous one or fracking, but there's also um, you know, battles about certain plastics and that's what you're telling you health that are fire retardants and child So the science journalists, um, oh and the, the, the battle of whether the science is sponsored by corporations that benefit from it. Um, so the science journalists, how do you navigate those they're difficult, and you know, people complain about science of journalism generally being too much of this. He said, she said, and, you know, trying to give both sides. But because a lot of these issues that you mentioned, something like fracking, is a perfect example. Of to what extent does fracking, you know, harmful chemicals? To what extent is it causing earthquakes? All of these issues. Um, the best that you can do as a science writer, since you're not going to you're certainly not going to be able to settle the issue, and you're not going to have the expertise. All you can do is talk to people and try to use your good judgment and get some weighted sample here um, and then present it in that weighted manner. So if there is one side that is perhaps a little bit more, has a little bit more of the evidence on their side, that's how you present it. That's the best you can do. You cannot settle the issue for anybody. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff, especially in the environment where it's still being sorted out. Fracking is a perfect example of that. Um, but you know, we cannot we can't solve the problem. We can just report it as best we can, and that comes through uh, through doing good reporting and through presenting presenting it, the story, not necessarily as an even-handed story, if it isn't, but, you know, if it's 60, 40, 70, 30, whatever it happens to be, that's the best that you can do. There's been a bunch of uh, examples of it. Um, I got, I got actually some guy is sending recently his, his study um, with trying to understand, understand certain kinds of mites that, that infect um, ants and that they have a lot of impact on ant behavior. And he actually put together something really cool on it. He raised a lot of money for it so he's able to continue his research on these mites. Um, and there have been a number of studies of um, studying behavior, studying um, what was I actually just heard about one the other day that raised a huge amount of money, mm -hmm. and it was also medically related. So there have been a number of cases where people have earned as much as two hundred fifty thousand to half a million dollars in crowdsourcing, but most of the others have been in the order of you know, hundreds to thousands of dollars, which isn't much for a lot of kinds of science. But on the other hand, especially for things like field research, that, that can go a long way. Um, the question is, are we going to be able to fund major, serious, sustained, basic research on, on crowdsourcing? Probably not, but you know, at least it's, it is a new way of bringing money in, and it's something to consider for young scientists to keep them going until you know the United States gets its act back in you know, in order, and so more of the money goes back to NIH, back to NSF, you know, that we start to devote more of of our resources to scientific research. But in the meantime, it can be a good stopgap measure. But it is smaller scale. Um, do you think that the crowdsourcing brings a new kind of person into science that otherwise wouldn't be naturally interested in it? Yes, definitely. I think as with doing these kinds of citizen science activities, I think that when people start to read about, and you know, there are several of these now, these websites that uh, do this for science, um, 
when people go and read these projects and see the proposals and videos posted and so on, I think they very much feel like they're part of the enterprise. Now, this is something that they hadn't necessarily felt before, although I wish they would, because in fact, science almost invariably belongs to all of us, because most of it is paid for by us. So it is ours, but I think only through this much more direct connection do people suddenly say, oh, wow. And then they start reading more. I, you know, I know I've directed several people that I know who various reasons, not scientists, to these places, and they start reading through all these proposals. It's like, wow, I had no idea that so many people were out there asking these interesting questions. So I do think that it's, it's a positive sign of getting people um, to pay more attention. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good development. So I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to see some way in which it, uh, it really become a sustained engagement in the public through these, these kinds of measures. And I also think that the internet has helped where people can, well now for example, people can look at data for um, discovering exoplanets that might be uh, this right sort of Goldilocks planet to harbor life. And so uh, NASA has these programs now where they will get anyone who's interested in looking for habitable plants, they'll give you all the details, basically all this data that they have, and you can start looking through it for patterns. And people have done that. Apparently there have been two or three publications of these plants that have depended on citizen science input. And I think that there's going to be more and more of that. So to the extent that scientists can keep that in mind when designing their research protocol, that's all to the good of everybody. I'm very optimistic about that. My word of encouragement is that, um, well, maybe there are two questions here, whether you should be a scientist at all. I mean, no, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be a yeah. <laughs> Whether you should study female brain and, or... Well, just in general, like, what are your words of encouragement or, or you know, how, what are ways that we can get more involved besides, you've already talked about policy, um, to sort of change the way that both women are seen in the field of science as well as I think the more women that go into science and stay in science, um, the, the better. And that, it's obviously been happening. And the numbers are going up, although much slower than we, we would have liked, especially at the higher levels. They are maybe below what we would have liked. But I think I would encourage anybody who's doing science, uh, it's just a great job. I mean, it really is. And it's, it's a privileged life. Now, one of the things I actually really strongly believe, and I, I'm not a religious person, but I do believe that we have a moral obligation to use this gift of, of consciousness and ability to understand the world, that we continue to explore the world and to try to understand it. And as a scientist, you're at the very forefront of that. And you just pushing knowledge forward is your obligation as a human being. If you can do it, you should do it. Um, so think of it that way. Think of it as almost like a calling rather than just even just a career, which is also a great thing. But it's a calling. And if you are trained in it and you have the ability to do it, you know, you should just, no matter what obligations come into it, what uh, impediments come up, you should pursue it. Now, Vera Rubin talked about that. She's an astronomer, She's very well known for her work on uh, dark matter. You know, people say, oh, but it's so hard to be an astronomer and there's so few jobs. And she says, if you love it, you do it. 
it will work for you. And you know, that's a little bit Pollyannish, maybe. But at the same time, if you have that passion and if you're doing it, I think it will work for you. Find, you know, figuring out how to make it work together with your family obligations. This still, this is difficult. Um, but maybe things are improving there a little bit too. For example, NIH already has this program in place where if you have a grant and you you know want you need to take time off for maternity leave, the clock stops then. So you're if you have a five year grant and you have to take off you know a year or whatever it is, the clock is stopped and you resume it and it keeps going. That's NIH. The NSF is doing the same thing now. So. You know, things like that that are happening that I think are an encouraging sign and an awareness that women in science um, do great work, and, but sometimes they need something like that, and just because biologically we are still the ones who have the children. So I think that that's encouraging. But mostly I just think, yeah, you have it ethical obligation as a trained and observant scientist to just keep pushing forward. I do really believe that. I mean, I like other species like octopuses, but they can't really figure out what's going on in the exoplanets, and so I think it, we can do it. <laughs> is that scientists, even when they're talking to someone in a completely different field, like you're talking to a particle physicist or whatever it may be, that you, first of all, maybe you don't feel as intimidated, so you don't feel as though you're not entitled to even ask the questions of this person that you're presumably talking to. Or, but if you're talking about reading their journals, well, that you probably are not going to be able to do that, but we have a limited lifespan anyway, and there's so many things that we can't read that we'd like to. I think scientists should be able to explain what they're doing very clearly in lay language, not just for the sake of explaining to lay people, but because my experience is that scientists who cannot describe their, their research to somebody in clear lay language are still a little fuzzy in their own minds about what they're actually doing. And that the, the higher the level of scientists, I, this has been my experience at least, that they, they tend to be very good at also explaining their research because they've thought it through themselves. They, everything that they're doing, you know, they sort of try to put the pieces together. And a lot of them have experience writing grants too. And sometimes they have to be much more general than their papers are. So scientists should be able to explain what they're doing, and they should be able to explain it at any number of levels of you know, sophistication. Um, and maybe we just need to have more of that, more of these kinds of interdisciplinary discussions. This is a whole movement, too, this whole interdisciplinary bringing scientists together from different fields and seeing what comes out of it. But a scientist who can't explain what they're doing clearly is a scientist who doesn't really quite know what they're doing. So I think to, and I know that this is true as a writer too, that until I can write it, 
I haven't really figured it out. And that's what makes writing so hard, is because as you're writing, you're figuring it out. It's like you're, basically, it's a problem solving exercise. And it's the same with explaining your science, the problem solving exercise. As a follow up to that, um, so I feel like you're saying that scientists should be able to bring it down to the public level. So do you think it's like unreasonable to have the hope or expectation that we can bring the public up to the scientist level? Well, what do you mean by the scientist level? Because if you're again talking about um, a more of a generalist understanding, yes, I think that I, to me the biggest the biggest gap in getting people to be to have a, to be able to understand science. Um, there are certain things that have come up, like having a much better knowledge of statistics. This is really and probabilities, um, even. Even very simple things, like I talked about in the canon, getting people to do these exercises like flipping a coin a hundred times and writing out whether it's heads or tails, and you start to see these patterns that show up. You know, where you have you know, five, six, seven heads or tails in a row. Um, and until you actually can do that experiment, you tend to think of randomness as being much more random than it really is back and forth. And that when people start to even get just that very basic understanding of, of uh, probabilities, I think that it starts to make their thinking, um, their critical thinking skills, all of a sudden come into play, where you're not just prone to, to superstitious thinking, where you are actually not seeing patterns everywhere as having only the meaning. And that's, one of the foundations. And, um, but the other one that I think is important is just feeling the self-confidence to understand the science. Jackie Barton, who's a chemist at Caltech, and she, you know, she just talked about this quite a bit, that people say to her, when they find out she's a chemist, oh, I flunked high school chemistry. Every single person in America flunked high school chemistry. <laughs> and it's unbelievable how many and um, she, and then they, and then they immediately, on saying that, that's like their their ticket to never have to listen to another word she says. <laughs> and uh, and she gets a little annoyed at that because they're almost proud of their ignorance, and they're sticking by. I stand by my ignorance. And she says people don't have that feeling about if you were to you know be politically ignorant about the situation in Iraq and all people are, but you, you wouldn't brag about it. So she actually thinks that people should be, that shame should be more of a motivator to get people to spend a little more time to say, hmm, maybe I actually should try to understand this, these issues. Like, maybe I should try to understand what it means when we talk about DNA or a cell or whatever it happens to be. And she thinks that people sh can do it and should do it, and that there should be more of a an expectation that they're going to do it. Um, but by the same token, I, mean, that I, I actually think that there's a more general anti-intellectualism that interferes with this. Uh, that we focus on scientific ignorance, but there's actually a lot of ignorance generally. I mean, I mentioned Iraq as an example. But I mean, th there's a lot of ignorance about history, about you know, where nations are located, you know, all sorts of things that we should all be a lot more ashamed about than we are. So, but science, I think people, if they feel like they can, if they feel entitled, and if they make just a reasonably you know, concerted effort, they, they can actually get brought up quite a bit. As a science writer, I try to do my bit, but there's, there's a lot to be done. People, uh, people are also busy. And they have their own lives, and you understand that. Do the best you can, soldier on. <laughs> Be calm, yeah. Well, actually, that's one of the things that I've often said I like about scientists. They tend to be pretty rational people. They don't get too excited and about, you know, it's like hysterical. And uh, that's actually a nice mindset to be around. It's like, oh, the world's not going to end tomorrow. And, uh, and that's the kind of thinking I'd like to see brought to bear in other areas of life. That's why I encourage scientists to become 
more active in the community. And they, they just, they're reasonable, mostly reasonable. So look at the evidence, okay, we can do a cost benefit or a risk analysis. And instead of just saying, oh, there's too much mercury in the tuna, it's like, well, how much mercury, how much tuna can I eat without having to worry? You know, you can start to actually do your own cost benefit analysis. You can look at all sorts of problems with this mindset, and, and all of a sudden you don't feel so scared, you don't feel so helpless. Um, so these are also basic skills that I think could be useful to people, just to, to do the experiment where you can, to weigh the evidence, and to not be so, you know, not be so afraid and intimidated. One last question. So I, my, my question, I think, relates to what you were just talking about, because you talked a little bit about probability and also about ignorance. And I think that the public often views science as sort of like some collection of facts. And, and, and a lot of the science writing, um, I mean, good science writing is not like this, but, but a lot of the science writing that you read is like, this locus is associated with, with such and such disease. It, it seems like, like reporting facts that scientists have found. Um, or, and, and my entire primary education was teaching me facts of, of science, like you know that the Earth goes around the sun, which to me, I don't really mind being ignorant of. I don't really know how that matters or why I should actually care about that at all. It just seems silly to me that that was what my education was about. Um, to me, science is about evidence. And um, to understand that, you have to understand the basic probability of statistics, that basic literacy that you were talking about earlier. And how is it, it first of all, do you agree? Um, and second, <laughs> secondly, if you do, how as a science journalist do you incorporate this focus on evidence rather than fact while, <coughs> while speaking to a population that, that, can't, that doesn't know like what a p-value is? I mean, to me it seems like Every, every Tuesday, the, the Science Times should just be the basic like thing, science literacy, so that people could like learn those things before they can actually go learn a bunch of facts that aren't really important. They should just learn how to evaluate evidence and think statistically. Well, you know, it, you try to do that by describing, um, describing the experiments that were done. If you talk about how the research was done and what they found, um, but that's that's a good part of talking about evidence-based as opposed to just stating the fact. Okay, uh, and it's especially good if you have the have room to actually go through several sort of stages of that. I mean, I'm talking about alternative hypotheses and interpretations. Um, but there is also a limit to how much you can do with any one article. There's a limit in the space. And what you try to do is you try to get people interested in, in this particular subject. I mean, that's what I feel like my greatest obligation is to get them interested enough to go further with it. Because right there in the you know, limited amount of space, you, you, you can only accomplish so much. But in terms of the body of facts thing, let me tell you that that is the number one complaint that I get. As scientists, what do they wish the public understood about science? One, that science is not a body of facts. So that is number one. Number two is learn more that they wish they under, had some basic understanding of statistics and probabilities. Um, so those are the two big things that come up from every scientist in every field. And I agree, the body of facts things is very important. But at the same time, when you're writing a story, to talk in generalities is is kind of that's it. You've lost your audience. So you have to you have to give examples and you have to talk about um, specifics and you have to talk about things as though there is some basis in fact that it isn't all just up in the air. So. You can only go so far in saying science is not a body of facts. No, but it is an understanding that has particular details in it. And those details are always what bring things alive to people. That the abstraction is what 
kind of puts them off. And it's the details that engage them. It's like knowing the personality of a friend or something. So as a writer, that is your obligation, is to engage the reader um, and not just be didactic. Uh, so, so sometimes, yes, you do have to talk about particulars. There's no way around it if you don't write a decent story. And so, there, you know, as a writer, you struggle with this too. I mean, any one story can only accomplish so much. I mean, you just hope that if the person really likes the subject, I have to say, one of my proudest things was, I wrote a story, this was a while ago, but about orchids, and I, and uh, a friend of my brother's, who was in, like, she was in sound editing or something, she read the story, she says, this is what I want to do with my life. She went back to school and got a PhD and is now a botanist. And so, I like to think every so often what you, what you want to do is say, oh, this is interesting. I think I'll look in more. And that's why, you know, there are now all these links scattered throughout. So you can, you can look into it yourself. And that's what you hope to do, is to get people turned on to the subject that they might otherwise have had nothing, no interest in at all. And if you do that in a responsible way, that's a, in the end, probably the best you can do. And I can tell you the space is getting tighter and tighter and everything is being squeezed. So. Yeah, I don't mean to, I, I love science journalism. I, I think that the problem really lies with like science education. But, yes. but yeah. Uh, well, I agree with that too. I mean, there's another area that we need a lot of improvement, really need a lot of improvement. But that also takes money, and then there's not enough fund it, and, and so um, <laughs> it quickly gets into these like enormous problems on a society-wide basis that you, you think, you know, there are a lot of people working on this. I can tell you this again because I hear it from you know people who are back there in the White House who would really care about good science education, but every single little thing they try to do is becomes politicized. Everything, every single thing. And how do we get past that? How, what are we going to do about this terrible problem of partisanship that is really completely crippling our country and, and stopping progress when there can be a lot more done? But every single thing now is seen as a political act, even in science. Um, and it's, it's really too bad. I do think that that is something that we need to address as a nation somehow. And that's why, again, I think we've got to get more scientists in there doing the politics, doing, you know, just getting to Washington and moving this ship forward. Well, I think we're just about <laughs> yeah. out of um, I just wanted to close by commenting that we are sitting here in a perfect storm caused by the tools and results of science, the values, the bipartisan politics that we're sort of in the middle of. The human genome has been sequenced. If you caught the New York Times on Sunday, the Obama administration is looking at the possibility of, of creating a huge project to map the active human brain, um, just like the Human Genome Project was started in the 1990s. So these are no longer issues just for discussion. So I wanted to close by, by saying for those of us who are scientists in the room, it is time to bring our very clearest lens to asking to how we ask and answer questions and fully understand what our data are telling us. For the academics in the room, which is the rest of us, um, it is time to teach and learn scientific literacy and critical thinking. It's time to learn how to be responsible about the knowledge that science brings us. And I'd like to thank Natalie Andrew, who's been a primary crusader in this effort. And I hope that our conversation together has brought this campus forward. In this so thank you very much. Ms. Andrew and Professor Levin, 
Um, we hope this then continues more dialogue about these issues. Um, and this is recorded, so you can see this online and share it with your friends as well. So let's join in another round of applause for our wonderful.